Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Andre. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the Ryerson Leadership Lab. Uh, we here at the Leadership Lab, we're committed to developing new leaders and solutions to make progress on some of our most pressing civic challenges. And one of those pressing challenges that we're engaged in is the security and privacy of Canadians online. And so this town hall is part of an ongoing series on security and privacy policy in Canada as part of a new uh, partnership between the Leadership Lab and the Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst, which is a center of excellence in cybersecurity activities based at Ryerson in Brampton, Ontario. Uh, they also deliver an accelerated cybersecurity training program to new Canadians, women, and displaced workers. I wanna welcome some of those learners uh, from that program to this town hall as well. Um, and this partnership is dedicated to advancing effective and innovative public policy in cybersecurity and digital privacy. It's called the Cybersecure Policy Exchange. I would encourage you to visit our website and get involved. Uh, it's gonna be an exciting and hopefully productive uh, effort. And uh, this partnership in the town hall itself is made possible by the generous contributions of RBC. I wanna welcome members of the RBC team today here as well. So uh, 7 million students across the country from kindergarten to university are out of school. Uh, they and their educators are rapidly adopting new education technology as uh, schools and students scramble um, to uh, figure out how to access uh, education uh, through uh, technology and internet access. Um, how can and should our education systems ensure that the security and privacy of our students is maintained uh, amidst this crisis? And what are acceptable trade-offs uh, to help us sort of tackle these tricky issues? Uh, we are pleased to have a great panel to share their insights uh, with us today. Uh, so the first uh, member of our panel is uh, Carolyn Alfonso, who is the education reporter at The Globe and Mail. Uh, Carolyn has an impressive 20-year career with The Globe and Mail uh, and has been following closely and reporting on the challenges of remote learning amid uh, COVID-19. Uh, she also, last week, I want to embarrass her, won the National Newspaper Award for short feature. Um, and I should also most, most importantly, is a Ryerson graduate. Um, uh, uh, Jeremy is the Chief Strategy Officer for Desire to Learn. Uh, Jeremy's been actively involved in starting and running technology companies for over 20 years uh, and was part of the founding team at D2L, uh, serving as COO, CTO, and now uh, Chief Strategy Officer. Uh, D2L operates the Brightspace Learning Management System, uh, which is used by many education systems, including a province-wide uh, contract with Ontario's K-12 uh, system. Jeremy is also a member of the Future Skills Council, which advises the federal government on skills development and training priorities. And finally, uh, Peter. Peter Singh is the Executive Officer of Information Technology, Information Management, Freedom of Information, and Privacy at the Toronto District School Board. Peter brings nearly 30 years of experience in K-12 technology and has been the TDSB's Chief Technology Officer for the last seven years. Uh, he's also been at the forefront of bringing a lot of new technology to Canada's largest school board. So thank you all for coming and for uh, bringing your expertise. We're excited to get started. Um, so for our, our audience, a note, uh, we welcome and encourage your participation. Uh, the chat function is on, so you can feel free to enter uh, your comments there. Uh, we are going to collect questions on Slido. So for people not familiar with Slido, it's S-L-I-D-O uh, dot com. And use the event code CPX school. We are going to put that in the chat as well, CPX school. Uh, you can Pose your questions there. You can also vote for other people's questions and we'll try to take uh, questions that come to uh, the top. Uh, there it is in the chat box. Um, so we encourage you to give us your questions. Um, and I also wanna note that this town hall is being recorded and will be posted in the coming days uh, on our website. Um, so let's get into it. Um, so each of you uh, on the panel, you know how you have different vantage points uh, from for how this unprecedented shift to remote learning uh, has been going. So we're now in week seven of this uh, shift. So I, I wanted to start by hearing from each of you how you think remote learning is going and maybe just start by collecting what are the biggest challenges that, uh, that students, educators, parents are facing. Uh, Carolyn, do you wanna go first? First of all, thanks for having me, Sam. Um, so I, I think I come to this from the standpoint uh, of a parent and as a journalist who's sort of reporting on this and observing this, as a parent, I have a five-year-old in my house and a nine-year-old, and the five-year-old is busy coloring and 
drawing pictures and playing and building forts and she's probably building another fort somewhere in this house at this very moment so she's just enjoying this part of it you know she loves school but she's home my nine-year-old who's in grade three well you know he's been he's been thrown into this distance learning this emergency remote learning and you know we have had to adapt as a family to it you know we are learning as we go with Google Classroom. His teacher has been wonderful, but, you know, we are lucky enough that we have jobs, we have the resources, we have the technology at home, uh, but still, it's a lot to, to do in a day, and, you know, he has to learn how to to adapt to it, how to, um, how to use it, and that's been a steep learning curve for him. Um, and I think that anxiety, that sort of sentiment has been shared by families right across the country that I've been speaking to in my work as a journalist. So there are families that you know, are doing fine. They enjoy it. They, they, are, they have adapted to it. They have, the, they have the resources to be able to do it. Their kids are thriving. And there's other families that are struggling with it. Um, I recently had an article in the Global Mail that received a huge reaction because I think it resonated with a lot of families where families are sort of so overwhelmed. You know, you say it's week seven of distance learning. They're so overwhelmed by it that they're sort of thrown in the towel, right? Like, I cannot do this every day anymore. My, it's a struggle to get my kid in that chair doing that one hour of work a day or even half an hour of work a day you know they can learning happens in so many different ways the technology is too much um especially if you have multiple kids in the household you know the classes may be using google classroom or you have seesaw or you have a different application so you're sort of you know you're challenged as a parent weaving through those different applications for different assignments for kids and I think there is some anxiety among parents on how to do this. There's a lot of uncertainty in the system right now. And that's not to discredit the teachers. The teachers have been, I think, thrown into this and sort of, you know, learning as they go and, you know, with little training and doing as best they can. And many are doing very well under these circumstances. But I think it's right now, it's just sort of the uncertainty, the anxiety. Parents don't know when this is going to end, how this is going to end what the return to the classroom will look like. And so distance learning is, is proving to be a challenge for a number of families right across the country. Sam, I can't hear you. Thank you, sorry. And uh, I was just saying, if you could try to speak slightly louder, uh, we had a few comments that it's, it's hard to uh, hear your great I, I comments. Will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter, why don't we hear from you? Thank you. Thank you for actually putting this panel together. And uh, this is a little bit of a relief for me because we've been extremely busy uh, trying to respond to COVID-19 across the district because uh, living in the city of Toronto, we have quarter of a million students who come through our doors every day. And now when we realize we're going to be doing remote learning, the first thing for us was all our kids don't have devices with them. All our kids don't have access to internet. So we had to quickly actually juggle that piece and saying, how are we going to learn from them? That's where we triggered a survey going out to all the parents, asking them, please tell us if you have a device at home or if you don't. Um, and also we needed info from them if they have a reliable internet at home. So when we collected all that data, we started to look at it. Uh, initial data showed us that 17 to 20 percent uh, families need help from us, uh, but we were wrong. Uh, because uh, we kept the survey open for longer. It's still open and it continued uh, till end of April. We had close to 25% of our families who told us they need something from us. And uh, out of that 25%, we learned that 2.9% uh, kids don't have internet at home. So we need to make arrangements to make sure they have device. Then in some cases they have device plus an internet access at home. So that work started. So that kept us busy. At the same time, we also reached out to our teachers asking them around what kind of support they will need from us. As uh, Caroline just shared with us that teachers were not all familiar with this new space. So they needed help. 
And we also needed to quickly learn from them also what kind of help and what kind of support they needed. So they were very clear and explicit to us saying we will need uh, uh, in help around uh, providing content and curricular resources to students, assessment and evaluation, and sharing activities and assignments with students, supporting students with IEP, the list continues. Along with that one, we asked them uh, around the tools too, which tools they will need help with. And uh, Brightspace learning platform was at the top. They said, we would like to learn more about that. Uh, Google Classroom came next, Google Meet, Brightspace portfolio. Uh, in TDSP, we've been heavily invested into two ecosystem G Suite from Google along with uh, Brightspace. So we had these two ecosystems in place, but some of the teachers um, were not totally fluent in it. So they needed more help on it. So we have to quickly put learning together for them. What did we learn over uh, last seven weeks? Um, teachers having to shift their method of communicating, connecting, teaching, assessing. Uh, it's been a huge, huge challenge for a few of them. Some of them done it brilliantly. And uh, I was also reaching out to uh, local leadership and asking the superintendent saying what they've been experiencing out there in the schools. And uh, their feedback has been, uh, in, in a lot of cases, if the principal had the, the whole school, the, all the teachers actually on board, and they were all familiar with the same common tools, they found those schools have been successful in delivering remote learning. And wherever they saw there was a bit of fragmentation, that's where they're seeing challenges on both uh, teaching side uh, with the teachers, and also parents are struggling because they're seeing fragmentation that if they have two or three kids, one child is pretty familiar with the environment and the teacher has been excellent, they love it. The second child is struggling and the third child doesn't know what to do at all. So the same family is having three different experiences from the same school district, which is not really fair for both parents and also for teachers. So again, a lot of painful points and uh, we continue to learn from it. As the remote learning continues, teachers are having to do more of their regular duties digitally, which is a challenge. Assessment and evaluation. Initially, that's how it all started. Then they have to focus on the content and providing feedback, and then it jumps into assessment and evaluation. Each time a new task came along for them, uh, it's been a challenge for them. Plus, uh, we, we also learned that some teachers who were already doing this kind of remote learning in their classroom, either it was a flipped classroom, this was the second nature to them. They were all happy and they ran with it. But some of the teachers who have never touched the digital tools in the classroom, they had a different practice. Some of them are struggling with it. And some of them said, you know what, I'm going to learn the new tool very quickly and run with it. So we have seen all sorts of experience in TDSP. And uh, it's all over the place. It's a bit fragmented. And we wanted to make sure we continue to support our teachers and also parents. And uh, this week, we actually launched a learning opportunity for parents on both Brightspace and Google side. So there's um, webinars happening for parents so they can get familiar with what the kids are actually using at the classroom side. So not an easy journey for sure. Back to you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Very interesting points that I'd love to pick up on. Uh, Jeremy, uh, from your perspective, how has it been going? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so I guess, you know, D2L has obviously been on, on the front lines of the education response during the, this crisis um, in partnership with teachers and, and school districts and boards and, uh, and ministries around the world. You know, we operate in 40 different countries. So we've seen a, a variety of, of um, responses, but there's probably three things, um, you know, in terms of what we're seeing that I, I love, love to cover. The first one was, is really that um, no one was really ready for this, um, but that teachers everywhere are, are really doing wonders with given what they've been able to, uh, been in enabled with. Um, and Ontario in particular has been um, a fair bit ahead of, of the curve in such a difficult time. Um, I can count on probably one hand the number of jurisdictions that had the infrastructure already in place to enable fully online learning. And while it's not been that easy for teachers or parents, um, there has been a systematic effort to, to continue instruction. And, you know, that's really not been made any easier given the level of uncertainty surrounding uh, almost every aspect of this emergency response period. You know, how long it will last, um, how can parents cope, uh, and 
you know, with work and childcare, uh, you know, where does content come from? Does everyone have devices and connectivity as Peter mentioned? Um, you know, and what's at stake in each of these possible scenarios? So well, there's been a lot of learning through the process um, and some really rapid improvement. We know that uh, we need to start by making sure teachers have every tool and support they need to succeed in this future of school. Uh, and that also might look very different than what we're used to uh, for, for quite some time to come. So, so I wanna you know, personally highlight the Ontario teachers. They've taken enormous interest in helping uh, their students during this shift. We've had tens of thousands of Ontario teachers sign up for webinars on how to use the provincial uh, virtual learning uh, environment and to better use the advanced tools that uh, they have at their disposal. And many of them, you know, this is the first time they've been exposed to it, um, all looking to better support their students online. So that's the first thing. The second thing um, is really, you know, if it wasn't clear before, it should be pretty well understood now. Um, and that's that schools provide a much greater role in society than just learning. You know, we're seeing like, things like nutrition, and mental health and social supports. Um, schools have really become a checksum on society for, for our children. So, you know, some of this can be supported remotely and online. Um, you know, other realities are going to have to be addressed separately. At D2L, we're, we're considering how technology could support things like connections with counselors and mental health supports, and things like that. But, you know, we have to work closely with our partners and customers on the ground to ensure that it's appropriate and effective. Um, so if a pandemic such as this one were to continue much longer than expected, you know, there are some of these additional lenses we're going to need more work on uh, to consider holistically um, the functions that schools serve. And, and then the final thing is, um, you know, I think we're all becoming well aware of this, but not all online or distributed learning is created equal. Um, and, you know, our type of technology is being used to address you know, the same problem as Zoom and Google Docs. And, you know, people talk about this experiment in online learning, but that's, that's not really what's happening here. Schools, districts, ministries all over the world um, many times have cobbled together tools in, in a world of complete uncertainty. Um, you know, so we know that an LMS learning management system implemented with, you know, the right pedagogical considerations and rich content and um, enabling training for instructors is far, a far different experience than simply trying to mimic the face to face instruction via synchronous video, for example. Um, but much of what we have seen is exactly what you'd expect in an, uh, an environment where we're, you know, we were really forced to make a rapid transition online. Um, but what I hope is that over time, people will recognize there are big opportunities in the use of technology for online and blended learning, but that what we might have had to do as a society rushed into emergency remote teaching may not represent the full capabilities of a thoughtfully planned, high quality online uh, or blended learning program. So, so over the summer, um, you know, our, our hope is that we'll have a chance to pause, you know, breathe a little uh, and map out what can be done to provide high quality teaching and learning experiences next school year, whether it's, it's online or in person or some sort of hybrid of, the bo uh, of both. Because right now we, we don't really know what September will bring for classrooms around the world. And we've got this kind of, uh, we've been calling it a Schrodinger's classroom situation where we don't know if classrooms will be open or closed. Um, and if they are open, you know, what happens when the first kid has a cough or a child's parent contracts COVID, or parents are afraid to send their kids to a classroom, uh, or if the gathering rules prevent all children from being in the same classroom at one time. So, so we really should be planning now for how we leverage the digital infrastructure that we have to deliver a much more rich online teaching and learning experience, an environment that might look like some sort of mashup of face-to-face -face and online, uh, and one which isn't just keeping the lights on, but designed to provide a high quality education that our children that's great. So, I mean, I'd love to pick up on almost everything uh, you said and, and talk more about that. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll take the first thing that Peter said first, um, and we'll go through them kind of uh, one by one, which is about the digital divide. So, you know, the proportion of, of students and families that don't have access to internet devices. And I think um, to Carolyn's point, a support system at home to learn, even if they uh, do have access. Um, and so, as Peter mentioned, there's been a lot of efforts to distribute technology um, and internet connectivity uh, where possible. Um, so I guess my question is, do you think that this pandemic will change anything about how 
our school systems, our governments view the digital divide going forward, um, and what are some possible solutions that we could deploy to help close that gap now, but also after the pandemic is over. And Peter, maybe because you mentioned, I'll start with you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I think it's a very key piece. Uh, we always knew there is challenges in, in the city of Toronto. Uh, we have different uh, economically challenged neighborhoods in the cities. Uh, we run a program called Model School for Inner Cities, which uh, tries to help us to understand what kind of support is needed in those close to 150 schools or so. But you never imagine until you have the real data in, in front of you. And, and clearly we can see that now. And to me, uh, as a society, as a city, uh, also from an education side of things, we need to make investment in education. And Jeremy made that point too, that uh, we only looked at the schools from one lens. Now we really highlight what does the schooling bring to society? And uh, along with the devi devices side of things, uh, we have a program that actually focuses on the nutritional services side of things. So there's been a parallel program running, reaching out to kids in 170 schools in the city of Toronto to help them with, uh, I will call them gift cards at this stage because we're trying, we run a nutritional program in the school. Now kids are not at school, but they still need help at home. So we had to actually put that program uh, in play also at the same time. So coming back to the digital divide, this clearly has a interior education sector. We need to look at uh, 101 compute, which we have never been able to invest in or, uh, or have a funding that can sustain that 101 compute in a city like Toronto. I think we wanted to make sure the plans are done properly for remote learning. And you can see that I keep using the word remote learning. We have stayed away from e-learning because e-learning is totally different concept than what we've been actually asked to do. So this is a bit of more remote learning that we're trying to make happen uh, in TDSB. And we also wanted to make sure we shift uh, the priorities, how schools buy, school boards or schools buy technology. We wanted to make sure there's more investment into the mobile devices also. Some of the static uh, devices need to disappear from the system. So everyone has to be mobilized uh, with the tools. They can learn from anywhere, anytime, uh, kind of model and concept itself too. So I think the funding is the key and uh, proper funding has to be in, in play. Look at the, our counterparts in the US. A lot of school districts in the US have one-to-one -one compute. And their funding model is totally different the way we do here in Canada. They're able to go to the front lines, ask people that we're gonna put this bond out there, would you fund that compute? And it happens and, and every child carries a device with them. But in the city of Toronto, for us, we've been depending on a lot more on families. So a lot of families have bought devices for their uh, children. And uh, with that, and now what we're shipping out um, close to 55,000 uh, devices are being shipped to the families in, in Toronto alone. We're hoping that we have achieved that 101 need right now. And in parallel to that one, we have seen still around close to 14,000 or so students who still are received almost a paper-based lessons from us because we couldn't get the devices fast enough to them, but the, still the learning started uh, come, I think, this second week in April. So we have to quickly make some adjustments. How can we help the teacher and the student and the families to continue learning even they don't have a device in their hand? Again, the learning does not just happen with the device. The device is just a tool, a medium. And we wanted to make sure teachers uh, reach out to the student to make that connection. And there's a personal touch to the learning that happens, which could be through uh, even a phone call that needs to be made. And again, the concern also then comes down to the special needs kids, the specialized equipment. And uh, there's uh, quite a number of students in our system who need that equipment. So we, had, we needed to go back to each of those schools to make sure we have their equipment ready to be shipped to their houses so they can continue their learning itself too. So we were also extremely worried about all the SPECAD and special needs kids also in our system, which has been a huge challenge again as to quickly mobilize all that. and. This is just, I'm talking about devices. I haven't even touched what the teachers needed so they can actually connect with their learners to make this happen. So the divide is definitely there. We're hoping that the funding model will take a serious look at this 
and uh, the government will be interested in how we can facilitate that 101 compute across Ontario. Back to you, sir. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, do you have anything you want to add there? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that this pandemic has shown us uh, is where our weaknesses lie in creating a resilient learning system. Um, and it's really laid bare what we've known for decades, I think, which is that, you know, physical classrooms have been able to smooth out some of the inequities that we're talking about. Um, but when students go home to do homework, these inequities become very real. Um, and equity in access, you know, it was important before, but this pandemic's really exposed it as essential. Um, at D2L, we've been, we've been building our software to be accessible to all learners, including those without internet or the latest devices, but, um, but equity can't be addressed through just software, obviously. Um, a community approach is needed here, and, and we're seeing that happen uh, to a large degree today. So, you know, governments and school boards and, and, and the telecoms uh, are even stepping up to act, quick, act quickly and, and getting access to, um, to students and devices to students across the country. And in many ways, um, you know, it's technology that's allowed us to stay connected uh, right now to our jobs or to education to each other, um, which is fantastic, but it's still not universal. Uh, and I, you know, I hope that the effort to level that playing field doesn't stop after the pandemic's over. Um, I believe that in today's world, you know, internet access should be readily available to everyone as a human right. Um, it shouldn't be the responsibility of our school boards or education ministries to connect families uh, to a utility that's really become necessary to participate fully in everyday life. You know, whether that be finding a job or locating information or finding housing or connecting to healthcare or right now going to class. Um, and so equity gaps in accessibility to the internet are going to continue to accelerate the haves farther ahead of the have nots at an increasing pace, which uh, I don't feel like is accepted, should be acceptable. Um, now schools may have an obligation to ensure the tools they use for learning uh, are accessible to every student. And you know, that may mean providing a device to every student or simply to ensure the tools they adopt can be used on any device, regardless of type or age or, or even the operating system. And I think that's where it becomes critical to use platforms that uh, you know, have things like responsive design, which work on any device and, and those designed with accessibility in mind uh, to accommodate users with different abilities. Um, so for those of us at D2L, you know, breaking down barriers to education is one of our founding principles and one we hold deeply. But uh, for much of the rest of the world that isn't thinking about these things every day, I think this pandemic has probably pulled us forward about 10 years in terms of recognizing the importance and um, identifying where our gaps are and bringing to the forefront, you know, why we need to solve them uh, really quickly. Thank you. Um, and I would be remiss, there is a, a couple comments, Peter, that are the results of the survey that you've done going to be made available uh, publicly. Do you have any comment about that? Uh, no, the way we collected that data, that was just for internal use. So there was a, when we actually posted that survey, we actually told the parents it's just for internal use to use, distribute the devices. So the data collection is not intended for any other purpose. Okay. So we will make sure that those few facts you gave us are prominently uh, shared. Uh, Caroline, do you want to add anything on the digital divide? Just to, just to build on Jeremy's point, um, you know, I think that school boards across the country in Ontario have done a tremendous job at trying to get technology into the hands of students that don't have them. But you're remiss to point out, like, it's the school building is the place where you sort of narrow those gaps right those those gaps that you don't get from home and and you're you're you don't have that anymore and so that divide will persist what i'm more interested in is what happens when kids do return back to school what does this digital divide mean for when they return to the school building and what impact is this time going to have on their learning how far behind are those kids going to be? I mean, we have we have the summer slide that we all know about. You know, kids, there are kids in the summertime who lose some of those that some of that learning that they had uh, through the academic year. And teachers, you know, will sort of go back and review material from the previous year. But what what has this digital divide? that is persistent currently. I mean, you know, despite the efforts, the tremendous efforts of school boards, 
what will that mean when kids return to the classroom? What challenges will that persist? And what will it mean for gov the questions I have is what will it mean for governments and school boards going forward so that if something like this were to happen again, how quickly can we act on this? And that's those are those are the challenges that will persist and something to be thought about as we move forward. Great, thank you. And I think, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, will maybe be relevant for many months, maybe years to come as we as we navigate through to getting a vaccine and, and whatnot. Um, so maybe switching gears uh, more to the technology side. Um, so the increased reliance on personal devices at home, of, you know, educators or students um, are using their own personal devices. People using new software, new video call. Uh, software, learning apps, all of these open up new security vulnerabilities uh, for students, for educators, for school boards. So I wanted to hear from each of you sort of what are some of these security risks that people should uh, be worried about uh, and how can we protect uh, students and educators going forward? Um, so Jeremy, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, it's always important to strive for perfection on things like privacy and security. Um, I think we have to recognize that, especially in a situation like we're facing right now, that the world is pretty unprepared for the response. Um, now, you know, when we look at jurisdictions like Ontario, we were, you know, in a much better situation than many other jurisdictions, given that they had a, you know, a province-wide license to a highly secure enterprise system, you know, with Brightspace since 2005. You know, there's other jurisdictions like Gwinnett County in Georgia. Um, where they had adopted our technology across, uh, you know, one of their largest school districts to support. It was actually put in place um, in part to support um, digital snow days. So, you know, they'd have 183,000 students all go online and, and uh, during a snow day instead of missing school. So now the kids don't always love that. Um, so I know I used to love snow days, but uh, but they can literally take the whole district fully online overnight uh, or in the case of this pandemic, just stay online as needed. Um, but when we look at many other jurisdictions around the world, they were wholly unprepared and, you know, they're effectively starting from scratch. So, so in many places, teachers were just told to go figure it out. Um, and that's where we've seen considerations for things like privacy and security and accessibility and equity go out the window. Um, and the pragmatism that was required, uh, was, you know, basically forced people to use the fastest, cheapest, easiest point solutions they could find to get online and connect with students and parents. So, you know, I think this is the strength of education systems doing robust evaluations of the tools available in the market and taking into consideration things like security, privacy, uh, and the business models around student data, um, along with the other aspects of the successful technology adoptions. So things like vendor partnership, professional development requirements and uptime and all of the things like that. So, you know, this is this is a highly effective as a proactive approach to building digital infrastructure, uh, which has become critical infrastructure more quickly than maybe we'd ever expected over the last few months. Um, and, you know, t teachers shouldn't be expected to be responsible for being security and privacy as privacy experts on top of the myriad of roles they play for their students. But, you know, that requires enterprise thinking and preparation and proactive investment and the enablement and professional development that goes along. Um, you know, I know, I know we're going to talk a little bit about security or not just security, but also privacy today. And I I'd like to say, I'm really glad that, um, this panel is also tackling security and privacy as separate objectives, because that's what they are. Um, and too often privacy and security are lumped into a single category, um, that negate one for the other. Um, you know, security is the first critical layer to protecting student, teacher, and parent data. And it's things like, you know, the encryption and passwords or multi-factor authentication and literal locks and other devices that keep unauthorized individuals from accessing networks and data. And privacy is more about features and authorizations and business models, terms of use and, and permissions for how your data is used. So, you know, any search for digital tools should definitely include robust security requirements of the providers. Um, now, at D2L, we view security uh, of our education platform as the first and most critical layer uh, to protecting student, teacher, and parent data. And even if you, if you didn't have a team capable of um, doing a full security audit on a company yourself, um, there are some easy proxies you can look for to 
to ensure appropriate levels of security plans, uh, compliance uh, are met. So, for example, D2L holds um, an ISO certification for security and another one for privacy protections. These are internationally recognized and audited standards that should give you some comfort that rigorous compliance standards are met by the company and the tools that you're considering. Um, and that's just one way, one way you can validate that you're getting a secure product. Thanks. So, Peter, maybe I'll turn to you. You obviously are in charge of the biggest enterprise in Canada, technology-wise, um, from an education perspective. Um, how is the TDSB grappling uh, with this challenge um, as, and maybe to Jeremy's point, increasingly the use of non-standard products, like when people are, are using free resources online uh, and uh, the challenges that come with that? Sam, it's, it's an ongoing challenge for sure. And I'll, I'll share some of the approach we took. The first thing was uh, for us to, we wanted to make sure we inform teachers as we've gone into this remote learning mode, uh, they're still responsible for some of the things. Uh, when we are here at the school, as uh, Caroline said, we have a little bit of a different approach. You are in the bubble in the shell, you think all those things have been taken care of. But when you're at home, the other logic things come into the mix. You have a home Wi-Fi. You still need to protect that one. You wanted to make sure that passwords you use on the board accounts is different than what you have in the personal one. You're not sharing those passwords with the household members. And you still need to lock your Wi-Fi uh, compute stuff up. You also wanted to make sure the space you're in is also protecting because you're going to be looking at some confidential stuff when it comes to the students, the files related to kids, and other content. Uh, that needs to be protected. So you want to have a square space in the house, which is a work related, where you're going to put the files and things like that away too. At the same time, we wanted to make sure they're protecting their own identity too. So, and we have seen a lot of phishing campaigns also launched during this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we actually ran an awareness campaign informing all our users that you do have to be extra careful. So these are the things we're seeing. So at least they will pay attention to all this. I, we know phishing attacks are one way off of identity to get into your environment and uh, cause problems. Uh, also, you raised a good point around how are we telling teacher not to use every free service that's being offered? Right now, we learned that every, every vendor out there actually has made their product offering free. So you don't have to pay for it till end of the summer. It's easy for the company to do that for us, it, uh, any, anytime we onboard a product, we go through privacy impact assessment, a cyber security assessment, all that due diligence takes place. And these things are not a half a day, 30 minute uh, kind of activity. You quickly wrap up and you onboard a new product. So it's very challenging uh, to do that. So as, as we uncovered that some teachers were using the software product, which is not approved by the board, so our communication was very strong on that, saying you're not, you should not be using this with the students and uh, learners at all. And if you decide to still continue, you should be paying attention to what's in their uh, uh, acceptable use policy, what the terms of use are, where is the data going? What kind of data are they collecting? And uh, they needed to pay attention to all those pieces. So we continue to communicate on those uh, pieces with the teacher so they are fully aware of it, what responsibility they have to protect and help us to provide this uh, secure and at the same time have a privacy in place when it comes to learning. So it's, it's, it's not a clean cut slate. You can't make a hard decision when you're actually dealing with almost uh, close to 20,000 uh, learner teachers. We have uh, between 15 to 16,000 full-time teachers then we have occasional teachers it's a huge workforce to line them up very quickly uh, what needs to happen. So our strategy has been strong communication sending out. And, and, and some teachers fell in love with Zoom and we had challenges. Why I'm mentioning the product because it's been in the news uh, and there were some challenges in a few jurisdictions where uh, some unknown uh, folks jumped into a class lessons or something else and they had to shut it down. So. Again, we took a very serious uh, look at it, what's recommended, what's not, 
what was in place, we encourage teachers to continue to use what's in place already. So that's the approach we took. But uh, again, it's been a tough, tough task to convince everyone that you should be using these products, which are in a way green light. Uh, we want you to stay away from these products because they're not board supported. Great, thank you. And so, Carolyn, maybe uh, just to follow up on that, what are you hearing from from teachers and parents about you know the temptation to use non you know greenlit products or or in general um, uh, how this sort of security uh, features of all this new technology uh, are being treated? I think, um, I mean, uh, to Peter's point, I think it's interesting that the board has sent out a, a memo to teachers saying stick with our products. You know, there was some concern around Zoom. I know in BC, the Ministry of Education came out and said that they had, they had put some uh, security features around Zoom so that teachers in BC could use that product. Um, I think, you know, everybody has been thrown into this and a lot of teachers like peter said had not been using any of these products in their classroom in their teaching prior to this pandemic prior to a few months ago so i think there is a temptation to try something new try something different to reach out to students and um i think there's a lot of confusion out there as to what to do and there's so little training understandably because this is emergency distance learning nobody had time to sit down and train educators on what to use and what to do and that is happening on the fly i imagine right now um and i think there is a temptation i think the challenge for boards and the things that boards need to sort of communicate which probably they are doing at the moment as peter said is to indicate to teachers and educators what they need to use because there is a temptation to to uh, adopt new products because they are being offered by for free right now. And with little training on how to use it, there is a temptation to try it out. And, you know, security issues are a huge deal for families. They don't want their children's. We sign at the beginning of the school year, we sign these forms saying, you know, do you want your child's image shown on the TDSB's website, or do you want your child's artwork shown on the TD or in the school's website? And parents take that seriously, and they sign that, and now you're thrown into this online world where you're trying to navigate it. Parents are uh, sort of following along as best they can, I think. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, go ahead. So, and uh, at the same time, we also experienced some teachers were really uh, scared to actually do uh, video conferencing. They were scared that they will be recorded, that recording will be posted by the students out there on TikTok and things like that. So, it's it's a fear, and and because they haven't done it before, they were scared to do that. And uh, again. Uh, the teachers who were totally comfortable with it, they had those controls in place. How do you actually enable start a session, how you bring it down, how you make sure everyone's left. So it's again, lack of training has caused some more pain points for some of the teachers out there, for sure. Back to you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, so we're gonna start uh, taking questions now uh, from uh, Slido. So uh, please feel free to jump in and also vote. Uh, so that's S-L-I-D-O. Um, and uh, maybe I'll start with picking up a bit of what we were just talking about, about privacy in terms of use. Um, there's a good question in the chat about these kind of freemium platforms. Prodigy Math is used as an example where to get access to features, um, the students are required uh, to sign up. Um, and, you know, navigating all these terms of service um, uh, is obviously a lot to handle for teachers, uh, parents, students. Um, so, and, you know, monetization of data has been um, something that's come up, you know, it, people talk about the G Suite. Um, there, there's lawsuits in the United States about um, the G Suite's uh, use of biometric data. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of uh, dig into this um, challenge. Um, and uh, Jeremy, maybe I'll start with you as a company that produces this technology. How do you uh, wrestle with these challenges? 
Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, you know, and before COVID, uh, obviously conversations around student data and privacy were, were already starting to proliferate. Uh, as more people use technology in the classroom and outside the classroom, um, south of the border in the US, almost every state has proposed or implemented new privacy laws over the last couple of years. Uh, and, and in Europe, we've, uh, we've got the GDPR uh, in place now. Um, here in Canada, we've been having conversations about our own next generation of privacy framework. So I think this pandemic and the rapid move to distributed learning or, or online learning, remote learning, um, you know, it's going to serve to highlight the challenges and the importance of having these system wide considerations for the use of technology, coupled with broad awareness raising uh, its use. Um, in Canada, I've been involved in uh, numerous discussions with the federal government on our country's go forward approach to privacy regulation. And they recognize that there's a commercial need for the use of data as um, a central component in what is modern economic development, but also the need to balance that against the privacy needs and rights of individuals. And so those are the two key tensions that we see at play around the world today. Um, and yes, there's, you know, there's privacy weak points, uh, even in highly secure systems which tend to come down to people's day-to-day -day practices. So things like downloading private information onto personal computers and uh, that might be shared and taking it outside of a, a secure system on that shared device, for example, potentially creating privacy concerns. Um, but I think it's very important we differentiate how we solve those problems and the problems of choosing perhaps unknowingly to use a system that by their nature are either insecure or trading on the privacy of our children for financial gain. Um, you know, in, in any case of a tool that's used in the classroom, parents should be able to ask their boards and, you know, a few key questions to get a pretty clear answer. Questions like, will my child's data ever be sold? Or, you know, will, will you delete my child's data when it's no longer needed for educational purposes? Um, will my child be advertised to with her educational data, you know, not just now, but in the future? Um, in other words, are you saving this data for future use in advertising? Um, and, you know, what's the true business model for the company that's offering the tool? So, you know, we've talked about it's attractive to quickly grab something, you know, that's free, uh, maybe in perpetuity. But if you're not paying for a product, then you should ask if your student or children are the product. Uh, and I've looked at I've looked at other vendors out there. Some do a great job of, of, of really obscuring their privacy policies with legal jargon and, you know, endlessly nested links of policies by reference and sub policies, maybe hoping you'll just give up before trying to understand it. Um, you know, D2L takes privacy very seriously and, you know, we've launched, uh, we've taken the approach of launching what we call our privacy center uh, that really plainly discusses how we ensure student data privacy. So if, if anyone's interested and wants to see what it looks like, you can just go to d2l.com slash privacy dash center um, and see how we've represented. It's very clear and, um, Obviously, we don't do any of these things like advertising or selling big data. So, um, have a look. Uh, Caroline, I'm going to turn to you, but I am going to we put it in the chat. But I'm just going to like I know some folks are having trouble hearing uh, Caroline, and we will be posting the recording and we'll boost uh, the volume. And so, sorry about our uh, technical challenges. For that. I'm, I'm trying to speak as loudly as possible, but it may be my laptop that's causing problems. No, it's all good. I can hear you. So go ahead. If you do, you have anything you want to say about um, privacy terms of service? Um, you know, it's one of the things that's interesting is that um, the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association uh, took the approach that they would not be doing any live video or audio teachings with their students. They strongly advise their members against that because of issues around privacy and security and issues around equity. Um, and I know that other unions in Ontario and across the country are are also sort of advising their members to take a cautious approach of this because it's it's so brand new, right? And we don't understand uh, who, you know, you have very young students, as young as five in front of a computer in their in their living rooms, you don't know where it is. And there's a lot of concern around that at the moment. You know, parents may not necessarily be aware because they're trusting the school board. They're trusting the educator who's providing these resources to their kids. Um, and I think, you know, 
as this goes on, people are going to become more mindful and perhaps there'll be a lot of lessons learned from this pandemic on how to use online, how to use these online resources in a way that, you know, will protect students as they are protected in the classroom. We're doing the same thing as we're doing in the classroom. How can we do that? And that is going to be one of the main challenges going forward because this is going to my my inclination is this is going to go on into September. So we need to be mindful of that and take maybe the summertime to look into this. Uh, great. Uh, I'm just taking notes because I liked that very much. Uh, Peter, do you want to jump in? No, I was just uh, I was just browsing the questions now. Uh, there were some interesting questions popping up uh, for sure. Sam, which one would you want me to address? Just uh, if you had anything further you wanted to say about um, uh, how uh, boards are wrestling with uh, the privacy policies um, of different technologies, different apps, um, you mentioned it earlier. So if you don't have anything to add, it's okay. No, I, I think this is a, going to be an ongoing battle and challenge. As Jeremy shared with us, that some of the vendors are not helping with this. I think it's a partnership. We needed to make those uh, policies very simple so actually the parents can really understand what it means uh, being living in the city of toronto a lot of our parents actually work in privacy sector so they in their day-to-day -day gig uh, they could be at a bank insurance company or somewhere else so they actually deal with privacy on daily basis so we are constantly challenged by those parents asking the questions uh, what are you doing with the data and uh, who's looking at it, how long it's going to be. So all those things are being, uh, we've been addressing it, not just now, it's been a few years. Uh, so we are very, very careful. We do our due diligence when we actually onboard a solution or a product. So that's a key for us to make sure we're very transparent. Also on our external site, we actually publish uh, that. I remember there's a regulation in Ontario, MFIFA, everyone has to be in compliance with that. So to me, there's uh, expectations part of the regulation that you actually publish that information publicly and people are aware of it. And right now uh, we talked about, uh, Carolina talked about uh, signing off the dig digital consent form at the beginning of the school year. Um, we wanted to make sure it's not a one time done for the next 10 years. It has to be in front of the parents every year. It, it, they need to be constantly told that they have to look at these things because if you look at privacy and security, it has evolved big time in the last 10 years. And some of the things we're doing right now, we never actually looked at these things 10 years ago, but now they're at the forefront of it. And privacy by design, and uh, when uh, Ms. Kowarkian actually talked about it, uh, nobody was paying attention to it. Now it's actually part of the DNA. Every company and solution is actually trying to make sure that privacy is part of the design at the forefront, the very first thing they talk about it before they even start rolling out solutions. So it's definitely changed our lives and we need to pay more attention. And I jokingly tell my team, the perfect computer, the most safest one is the one you never turn on. And, and to me, we can't, we're not living in the world, we're always connected. So to me, we need to look at those pieces. How can we still protect everyone when, while they're connected? and they can actually do their compute with the right uh, functionality available and still protecting the data and solution they need access to it. Complicated space, but that's the work. And then we continue to work with the vendor partners and at the same time listening to parents and our community who is really hyperactive in Toronto. I don't have to tell you privacy stories in Toronto. We read them in the newspapers on a regularly weekly basis. Can I maybe just ask one follow-up to the point that you and, and Jeremy made about uh, the legislation itself, which is, um, is, is the balance right now in Canada between a, a consent model of privacy legislation where if you say yes, then it's allowed versus there being some things that just should not be allowed, especially for children and make things, certain things illegal around the monetization of data. Do you think that the balance is off right now and, and the legislation should be changed? Either of you, you want to? Um, I'll, I'll make a 
quick comment on that. I think that, um, I mean, I think the key thing with privacy is that you're aware of what your data is being used for and you've consented. To it. That's, that's the main thing. Um, I think what uh, in the technology space, especially what we've seen with um, companies with a global footprint or uh, that have some footprint in Europe with the introduction of GDPR, uh, companies like ours, you know, we've basically had to conform to what are now probably the most stringent um, privacy regulations globally. And because we have a single platform that we use to deploy around the world, we've effectively raised the bar from what the technology is required to do uh, and our processes uh, and people um, have had to do uh, based on the introduction of GDPR. So I think what much of the rest of the world is doing now is looking at, you know, what did GDPR add in terms of value? There were a few things that probably missed the mark on a little bit. Um, it was very, uh, it was introduced very much focused on kind of B2C and consumer type companies, the Facebooks of the world, um, you know, social media platforms, things like that. Um, and so there's some gaps in terms of how B2B works or, you know, business to business or, or B2B to C in the case, you know, um, where education is kind of the middle B between students and technology vendors. So um, I think the whole world is looking for the right solution. I think it's an evolutionary process that will make incremental improvements on. Um, but um, I think, as you say, the over the last even three years, uh, the world of privacy has changed and regulation um, has yet to kind of uh, consolidate around a single framework that's best for everyone. So it, it's a learning process, but I think we're getting there. Peter, do you mind no, I, I think uh, Jeremy actually highlighted how GDPR has really brought a shift uh, into our uh, privacy space. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, very soon we will see something in Canada too along the same lines. Uh, I know in the US uh, states like California and few have taken a jump start on that one. They already have something in place. I think we're missing that piece here in Canada. I think we'll love to see that. And the learning that has happened across the world can be brought into uh, privacy laws in Canada too. And I'm, I'm hoping in the very near future, we'll, we'll get that uh, guideline from the federal government also here. And that will help us to uh, make our life easier because it will force the vendors and the companies we work with to adhere to those uh, expectations. And uh, I have seen a shift with GDPR. Some of the global companies have taken that so seriously Every solution they bring to the table now, uh, they have re actually raised the bar when it comes to privacy and security, and uh, they have stepped up. So it's helping us in education for sure when mm -hmm. the vendor itself is doing it. So we don't have to do the heavy lifting, they do the heavy lifting. Otherwise, uh, we have to look at it, we assess, and if, you if we find the solution itself is not really, really protecting uh, and providing security and protecting privacy, we say no to it. And sometimes the no is not accepted well by teachers uh, saying, no, no, this is a good tool, I need it. I, we, we push back saying, no, this is not the right thing. We have other board approved tools which are in place. So that's the battle we're actually fighting on an ongoing basis. We wanted to make sure more and more teachers are actually are onboarding with, uh, I will call it green tools we have already in place and we have done the due diligence on those fronts. So I'd love to pick up on that um, and all of you can jump in and there's a few questions that I'll try to consolidate on this theme around teacher training and um, support for teachers. Um, so how should and could boards and uh, uh, technology companies support teachers in ensuring that they're using um, safe software uh, and um, approaches and, and what responsibility um, uh, does, does school boards have? Um, in that regard, um, and uh, yeah, I think I think I'll leave it there. Um, uh, uh, Peter, since you are from TDSB, do you want to start in answering that question? So I think the data doesn't matter; it's at rest, it's in transition, or it's sitting out there. It has to be protected at all times. So you have to have those controls in place. It doesn't matter if that computer is happening in house in your own environment or you're out there in the cloud, doesn't matter what solution it is, uh, our, our strategy is, has to be protected at all times. So we take that approach to make sure whatever solution we onboard actually addresses and meet those expectations. Um, Caroline, do you wanna add anything on that? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Sam? 
Sure, just um, how teachers can be best supported, the role of training um, and technical support in, in managing this transition. This is, this came about fast and it came, you know, it was, of course, teachers can be better supported, but this is, this is a very unusual situation. Nobody was prepared for this. And um, I think what this does is it allows us to step back and re-examine sort of the role of, uh, of online education on, on, on online education in the classroom. I think uh, there's been a lot of resistance to it, um, you know, to bringing sort of uh, online platforms and things like that, incorporating them in the classroom. I mean, in Ontario, there was a lot of resistance in recent discussions with teachers unions around e-learning, which is quite, I understand this is quite different from what we're doing today. But there's been a lot of resistance to it, and I think what this will teach us and what we will take back from it is that perhaps there needs to be more training um, once we sort of get back to normal, whatever normal looks like, around sort of incorporating some of these online elements into uh, the regular classroom teaching life that will happen. Uh, Jeremy? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, you know, one of the one of the most critical pieces to um, any technology adoption, I think there's three key pieces. I mean, is having the right infrastructure, um, which include, you know, hardware, software, connectivity, things like that. Um, you know, the software platforms, you know, things like that themselves. And then the other one is the enablement piece. People need to know how to use the tools you're giving them. Um, and so, uh, you know, but that that doesn't happen as a one off and it doesn't happen with any single party. And, and that's why, you know, we're working in partnership with school boards and the ministry uh, and, you know, at D2L ourselves, we're running multiple webinars per day. There's there's, you know, people dedicated to enabling those teachers in every, you know, one of the 72 uh, school boards across the province. Um, but it's as I say, it's not a one and done. It's an ongoing effort, um, just like any type of learning. Um, and uh, it's a process that takes time. So, you know, thrust into this kind of emergency response, there wasn't time, but I think we'll get there. And I think what we, what we have done is we have probably alleviated some of the initial fears, you know, that it was impossible or the hurdle was too high um, because everyone was kind of forced into it. So that, that if there's a silver lining to that, I think people have recognized that it is possible. Um, the barriers are not too high and there are things we need to fix and things we need to get better at. But that will come with time and with experience and with, with training and professional development. Uh, and we're all working to the same goal there. So, um, so I, I think we've, you know, we've compressed what probably would have been a 10 year journey into just a couple of months um, in many ways. Um, and coming out the other side of it, I think we'll, we'll have a much more resilient learning system um, around the world. Uh, that's great. And I maybe want to uh, ask Peter just a quick. Uh, question that I thought was was good in in um, the uh, Slido, and then I'll ask the next one, which is about storage of uh, data uh, in or outside of Canada. It is a requirement that uh, student data stay in Canada part of the uh, assessment that you do of new technology? So right now, the education sector itself is not legislated to keep that data in Canada, like some of the other verticals are. But uh, part of the best practice is that we push for that, uh, to make sure those are part of when we do RFPs or other activities to bring a vendor on board. Uh, those are the questions being asked, saying where does the data sit if it's going to be a SaaS solution? So that's, that's part of the due diligence. But uh, overall, right now, the education sector itself is not legislated like in British Columbia, they are not in Ontario. The data has to be here. That's why I was sharing earlier that doesn't matter where the data sits. It has to be protected at all times. So okay. that clarifies the position. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and then there's been a few questions uh, and I have this on my mind too, which is about how we get back into physical schools. Um, is probably going to look different. Caroline, I know you wrote an article about uh, Quebec's approach um, in 
you know, max class sizes of 15 um, and uh, uh, spreading people out, no gym class, no music. Um, so things are obviously going to look different. And I'm, I guess I'm wondering also, you know, students presumably will be coming in and out if they develop symptoms. And just for a while, um, the new normal is going to be different. What role do we think technology will play in all of that? Um, in supporting effective learning going forward, um, and what are the implications of that? Uh, I would love to hear from from all of you. Um, uh, uh, Caroline, do you want to start? Yeah, thanks, Sam. I think you know one of the, I'm really interested in how uh, Quebec is handling this this return to school. So, uh, Quebec students outside of Montreal and suburbs are expected to return to school next Monday. And it's voluntary, it's optional. Parents who choose to send their children can go to school. And then it'll happen in Montreal a week later, but that may be pushed back. I, you know, Quebec is a is interesting to watch insofar as what happens to the children whose parents decide, you know what, I'm not gonna send my kids to school. It's just, you know, it's too anxious right now. I'm gonna keep them home. What sort of learning are they receiving at home? What will continue? What online components will continue for them? Because that's sort of what would be replicated, I imagine, across the country as students return to school, the school building um, in the fall. I assume at some point, I, and I think all provincial governments right now are just sort of looking at Quebec, watching closely, seeing how they're handling it. They have rules in place. School boards have released rules in place about what school would look like. But, you know, if a child in a particular classroom is sick and it's a suspected COVID-19 case, that means all those kids would have to be home. All those kids would return back in some to some aspect of online learning. That would continue. So I think, you know, from what I'm hearing from people who are researching this, people who are experts in the field, is that there would be some sort of hybrid that we'd see going forward where perhaps kids are in the classroom, but kids are also at home doing sort of part-time online learning, or there's an option, whether you're returning full-time to school and your teacher is providing continuing on those platforms to provide online learning at home. Um, so, you know, for those reasons, I think Quebec is just fascinating right now, just to keep an eye on, because I think other provinces will sort of look at it and say, okay, maybe this is something we adopt in the fall or something similar that we take with us in the fall. Uh, that's great. Uh, Peter, do you want to jump in? This, this is hard because I'm not a subject matter expert on health, healthcare, uh, but I'm just having a parent perspective right now that uh, um, I have, uh, my parents are over 80 and uh, my father-in-law is over 80. So as a family, we've been taking extra precautions to make sure uh, none of us are exposing them to anything that comes from outside. So I'm just sharing that personal experience, what we're doing as a family right now. But uh, my kids are older, they're grown up, they're adults now. And uh, if you have younger kids in the school system, and, and it, it, it's such a touchy subject that even if we have a normal school opening and when the flu season kicks in, and, and, and those schools now become sometimes a breeding ground as the flu travels, and, and, and uh, different families, uh, kids coming from different families are bringing to the school and then it reaches out to others too. I'm just scared about those pieces. Again, I'm not a healthcare professional. For me, I'm just thinking logically saying, is that a complex piece? Now, how do we handle that? And, and to me, before even schools open, I'm looking at, we have around close to 40,000 staff members who work at TDSB. So we need to open the workplace first before we actually now open up the doors for teaching and learning in the schools. So I think we got, it has to be staged, uh, looking at the workplace first, and then the schools kick in, and uh, we will be keeping a close eye, and I'm sure uh, 
Ministry of Education and Interior Government will be giving direction to the school boards when it will be the right time to do that. And, and uh, it's fascinating to see Quebec, and uh, I was surprised. Uh, it's too early. Everyone in my family felt it was too early, what they were executing it. But again, they have their game plan, how they're going to make it happen. So I think this, let's call it an experiment right now, what they're trying in Quebec, and we will learn from it, as Caroline mentioned that too. We will all benefit from that learning, and that will help us to tweak how we can make it happen in other jurisdictions, even bigger cities like Toronto. So it, it's it's very, very touchy right now. Back to you. Caroline, you looked like you were going to jump in there. You know, Quebec is not alone. There are other jurisdictions within Canada who are trying to get kids back to school. I, in, in, you know, there's uh, Jason Kenney, the Premier of Alberta, mentioned uh, last week that uh, there's, you know, there's talks about how they could bring limited number of kids, perhaps in some schools, maybe some school boards would want to try it out, just early discussions in British Columbia. There are schools that are open right now for essential workers. We are for the kids of essential workers. Um, you know, so there, there are some openings happening and I will, you know, I'm really curious to find out how those openings will, will, how many families will send their children to school at the end of the day and how many will just say, you know what, until there's a vaccine. I'm just going to opt for the online component of it. And I assume that governments and school boards will have to continue in that direction. Jeremy, do you want to jump in on how D12 is thinking about this challenge? Yeah, happy to. Um, you know, I think my, my early refer earlier reference to this idea of, you know, Schrodinger's classroom, right, and the idea that we don't know going to happen in September and you know will classrooms be open or closed and and how do we plan for that um, and how you know maybe it's neither uh, maybe it's both um, and so the idea that you know we've always thought about um, you know face-to-face -face teaching or blended learning as using technology in the context of a face-to-face -face classroom um, and we've talked about online learning where all the students are online and learning remotely um, you know, but we, we could very well be in kind of a new hybrid model um, where we're looking to use technology to both complement what we're doing face to face and enhance the face to face experience for those that are there, but also provide some form of a rich learning experience for those that are remote and possibly asynchronously. So, not, not all at the same time. Um, the technology is, you know, the tool sets are there to support these types of things, um, but it's not something that's that's been done. Um, or proliferated, you know, widely. So it's going to be a bit of a, a learning curve, I think, for everyone in terms of, you know, how to do it properly. Um, we actually just, um, uh, my team just published a paper um, today, I believe, on this idea of the hybrid classroom for the, or what the fall could look like and some of the considerations. I'm happy to share the link in, in the chat if anyone wants to take a look at it. Um, exploration of Know, how these things might play out and the considerations we need to think about now uh, in order to be prepared for something that might be brand new for all of us. That's great, thanks. Um, there's one more sort of specific question that I have for Peter and then I'm gonna turn it over to all of you for closing thoughts with, with a guiding question. But uh, Peter, a couple of people have asked, is the TDSB's uh, green lit list of products available for parents or is it just an internal list? So, there's a list has been published for uh, families out there, and these are the tools they can actually use. So when they go to our WW site uh, under remote learning, uh, there's a resources section and it's all listed there. What can be consumed? Okay, great. Um, so I'd love to, with the uh, short amount of time we have left, get closing thoughts. And I think summarizing what I'm seeing in the chat and in the slide in Slido, I think. The thing probably on most people's mind is how to close the learning gaps that ha will definitely emerge from this challenge and also how to use this crisis to propel us to a place where we are more ready and gaps are, 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 are closed anyway. And so um, any closing remarks, but also your thoughts on how can we get there? What kind of mechanisms can we put in place? 
what have we seen around the world best practices in how to close that uh, technology and, and capability gap. Um, so, uh, Jeremy, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, just to respond to, the, to Chris's <laughs> comment there first is, uh, I, I agree, and if anyone has a better example, uh, I don't like being equated to poison uh, either, um, but I think people, many people know the example. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think the main thing as we go forward, kind of a parting thought is I think that this, you know, the challenges that we're facing right now, whether it be in education or healthcare or otherwise, um, none of these things are solvable um, by an individual, you know, organization or government department or individual. And in the only way we um, make progress and get through these things is in partnership. And so, you know, I'd like to, you know, just thank the, um, you know, people like Peter who are working every day in the school districts, um, the teachers that are working hard in the classrooms in, you know, uncharted territory. Um, it's, to, it's, it's a hero's effort um, that they're all making to make sure communication is flowing. And there are so many stakeholders uh, at the table that need to be uh, communicated to and managed and, and considered uh, and feedback taken from and et cetera. So, um, you know, I think as we've been saying the whole, this whole panel, there's lots we're learning, you know, we're iterating and getting better all the time, um, but everyone is pointed in the same direction and um, towards the same positive outcome. Um, and that's the only way that, um, you know, that we're gonna come through this thing and in anything that looks like a positive outcome. So um, I just, I really appreciate the partnership um, that we've seen with our with our customers and people like Peter and his colleagues at the other 70, 71 um, school boards across the province and, and then others around the world. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Carolyn? Um, you know, I, uh, I have two young people at home who are anxious to get back to the school building as quickly as possible. Um, anxious to see their friends. And I think, you know, that, that, that is echoed by thousands, millions of kids across this province and across this country. Um, I think teachers, uh, despite the steep learning curve, many teachers have embraced uh, or sort of just run with the technology and pull together curriculum and online learning. And, you know, many families have, have gone into it and um, made the best of it, but it has been a struggle and it is a struggle because nobody was prepared for this. How could you prepare for this? Right? And it's been a steep learning curve and I, I have, I have many questions and uh, at, at how we come out of this. I'm curious as to sort of how online learning will be adopted into the classroom, if it will be adopted into the classroom, how much of it will come into the classroom, um, you know, what kind of training teachers will receive coming out of this. And, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm curious to see sort of how our children would, will adapt to it. We, you know, my, my child, for example, uh, there are days where he will, he enjoys being on the computer doing his assignment and these other days he'd rather have pen to paper and he's happy doing that. Um, and we allow the flexibility of both. And it, I think, you know, at the end of the day, from what I'm, from speaking to experts and speaking to researchers on this, perhaps there will be a hybrid. And uh, as more teachers get um, acquainted with this online, these online platforms. Thank you. And Peter. No, no, thank you. It's, it's been, uh, I've been mean, looking at the barrage of questions coming in. I think we can continue for another hour or so. We won't be able to answer all of them. But I think uh, education uh, have changed forever. And, and to me, uh, with this now came an opportunity, how can actually we bring that shift? So to me, the learning does not just happen in the classroom. We've been saying it for a few years. Now we have a clear proof that it's not only in the classroom. So that ongoing learning around the clock uh, will be happening and we need to be ready for it. And we need to help uh, also the teachers who actually need to adopt this new space and what kind of, uh, it's not a retraining, it's, it's a new way of doing business in the classroom space. What kind of tools we can bring 
to the forefront and make sure they're totally digitally fluid in those tools. And they can actually, we can empower them with those tools and the kids who don't have access to devices, we empower them with the right device in their hands, closing the gap and addressing the marginalized, uh, economically challenged neighborhoods in our city. And I can see the city of Toronto is already looking at it. How can we provide Wi-Fi in some of these neighborhoods? Right. So kids actually, even if they have a device, they can actually have a connection to an internet. They can do their work in the business itself too. So everyone is starting to look at it, and this is an opportunity, and we need to shift our dollars. As in planning and project management, we always say that no plan survives its first contact. So this wasn't even planned; it was unplanned. So we're not expecting this; we are going to survive. But we learned quickly; we're adapting. And we're being nimble and, and we're trying to bring a shift. So to me, learning has happened. This is going to help us to tweak things. And hopefully the next school year, we will see a lot more digital fluency on both teacher side. And that will, the teach students will benefit from that fluency because the learning will shift. And has uh, Jeremy shared an example of the US where the school board actually started has a snow day plans, but it in cases like this one turns out to be the plan. So we might need to explore those things that we actually force ourselves to do online learning regular basis. When a crisis like this hit us, we're actually normal and the, the learning continues remotely uh, through the web and online and virtual remote learning will kick in. So we need to position, we need to train ourselves and the students need to be familiar with that model. Then instead of doing it for a day a month or once a while, it will become the norm. So again, Let's invest. Uh, we all need to invest, not just the dollars, time and resources too. People need to have an open mindset that we will try new things. And uh, the companies and the vendors, uh, they can't just have the free ride just for this school year end. If they're really committed to education, they want to make a difference. They want to make sure our economy benefits from it. We would like to see more long-term investments from the companies also in the education sector to really make a difference in this country. Back to you, Sam. Thank you. And thank you to everybody. Uh, lots of interesting ideas there um, and thoughts. And, and we so appreciate your time uh, with us today and for everyone for, um, for tuning in and participating. I thought it was a really uh, rich discussion. Uh, and this is part of an ongoing regular series once a week uh, at this time. So um, if you enjoyed this next week, I will be tackling uh, the digital divide by income and geography. Um, and you can see uh, more at cybersecurepolicy.ca um, to find out more. And we have an upcoming one with the uh, Privacy Commissioner of Canada's office. Um, so uh, we look forward to having you back. Once you close this, uh, feedback form will pop up right away in your browser. We'd love feedback on how to continue to make these uh, better and more interesting. Um, and we will be posting uh, the link to this online if you want to go back as well. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating, and I hope you uh, stay safe and well uh, and have a great evening. Thank you.